Brig the Mighty by Rodman Philbrick. Chapter 13. American Chop Suey. I used to think all that spooky stuff about Friday the 13th was just a pile of baloney, but now I'm getting my own personal introduction to what can happen. It's October, and so far things have been going pretty good, better than I ever expected. Me and Freak are like this unit, and even Mrs. Donnelly says she is starting to get used to us, which is her way of admitting that Freak is about twice as smart as she is, and for sure he's read more books. She keeps saying stuff like, Kevin, we know you know the answer, because you always know the answer, so wouldn't it be nice if someone else got a chance, for instance, your friend Maxwell? Freak goes, he knows the answer, Mrs. Donnelly. Yes, Kevin, and I'm sure you're correct, because you're always correct, but for a change, I'd really like to hear Maxwell speak for himself. Maxwell? Maxwell Kane? This is dumb, because what does it matter if I know the answer? If I don't know, then Freak will tell me, and he'll say it in a way I can understand, which is a lot better than Mrs. Donnelly can do. So what I do, I just shrug and smile and wait, because I know she'll get tired of asking and move on to the next. As a matter of fact, I do know the answer. The reason Johnny Tremaine got mad and hateful is because he burned his hand in a stupid accident. And I know about that because Freak has been showing me how to read a whole book, and for some reason, it all makes sense, where before it was just a bunch of words I didn't care about. My reading skills tutor, Mr. Meehan, says stuff like, Max, the tests have always shown you're not dyslexic or disabled, and this proves it. As you know, <laughs> my personal opinion has always been that you're lazy and stubborn and you didn't want to learn. So if hanging out with Kevin somehow improves your attitude and your skills, that's great. Keep up the good work. It was Mr. Meehan who had a word with Mrs. Donnelly, and that's why she finally gave up on trying to make me talk in class. And instead, she waits until study hall, where she asks me the same questions alone and I tell her the answers. She still doesn't get it, though, because she always goes, But, Maxwell, if you can speak to me, then you can speak to your classmates, right? Wrong. Big difference. I can't explain what it is, except that my mouth shuts up when there's more than one or two people, and a whole classroom full forget it. Okay, you're shy about public speaking, but how does that apply to writing down the answers? If you can read, then you can write, right? Wrong again. The reading stuff Freak helped me figure out by showing how words are just voices on paper. Writing down the words is a whole different story. No matter what Freak says, writing the stuff down is not like talking, and my hand feels so huge and clumsy. It's like the pencil is a piece of spaghetti or something, and it keeps slipping away. Mrs. Donnelly says okay for now. She's satisfied I can read, but we'll really have to work on this writing thing, won't we, Maxwell? And when she says that, I just nod and look away, because inside I'm thinking, forget it, no way. Like Freak says, reading is just a way of listening. And I could always listen, but writing is like talking, and that's a whole other ball game. Anyhow, what happens first on Friday the 13th? We're in homeroom when this note comes from the principal's office. Maxwell Kane, your presence is requested. Gulp. So Freak and I get up to go, and the teacher says, No, Kevin, you stay here. Mrs. Addison was very specific. Maxwell is to go alone. Freak starts to smart-mouth her, then he changes his mind, and he nudges me and whispers, Just give him your name, rank, and serial number. Deny everything. You aren't back by ten hundred hours, we'll organize a search and rescue mission. He offers to lend me his dictionary, in case I want to try out any big words on Mrs. Addison, but I'm already so worried about being called in alone all I can think is they're going to put me back in the learning disabled class. I've already decided I'll run away if they do that. I'll go live in the woods somewhere and jump out and scare people. Anyhow, I don't take Freak's Dictionary along, because my hands are trembly and I might drop it. Or Mrs. Addison might ask me a word and I'll forget how to look it up and prove I'm still a butthead goon. Mrs. Addison is waiting outside her office, like she does, and she's trying to smile, but she's not really a smiling kind of person, and I can tell this is serious, whatever it is. Like, maybe somebody died. I go, Graham! Is Graham okay? Yes, yes, everybody is fine. Come in and sit down, Maxwell, and please, try to relax. Yeah, right. Mrs. Addison is sitting there in her big chair, and she's looking up at the ceiling, and then she's looking at the floor, and at her hands, and finally she gets around to looking at me. This is rather difficult, Maxwell. I don't know where to begin. First, let me say, we're all pleased with your progress. It's nothing short of miraculous. And it almost convinces me you knew how to read at your level all along, and were for some reason keeping it a secret. 
I'm not really hearing what she's saying, because there's like this little bird fluttering around inside my chest, and it makes me blurt out, You're putting me back in LD, right? Mrs. Addison comes over and pats me on the shoulder. I can tell it makes her nervous, touching me, but she does it anyway. And she goes, No, no, nothing like that. This has nothing to do with school, Maxwell. This is a personal situation. Because if I have to go back in the LD class, I won't. I just won't. I'll run away. I will. I will. Maxwell, this is not about your classwork or even about school. This is about your, um, father. My, um, father? Which makes me wish all of a sudden I'd done something wrong and Mrs. Addison was just giving me detention. She takes a deep breath and folds her hands together like she's praying, and she says, A request has been forwarded to me from the parole board. A request from your father. Maxwell, your father wants to know if... I don't want to hear it! I jump up and cover my ears, holding my hands real tight. Don't want to hear it! Don't want to hear it! Don't! 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 What happens when you go nuts in the principal's office? She calls in the school nurse, and the two of them are trying to hug me and calm me down, and it's like I'm back in daycare or something. Maxwell, Mrs. Addison is saying, she's trying to prise my hand away from my ears. Maxwell, please forget about it, okay? Forget I said it. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do, okay? And I'll make sure of that. I promise. I swear on my honor. He can't make you do anything you don't want to do. I'm going to make that very clear to the parole board and to his lawyer. Very clear indeed. Finally, I take my hands off my ears, which wasn't really working because I could still hear everything they said. And, big surprise, I'm sitting in the corner of the room, down on the floor with my knees all hunched up, and I don't even remember how I got there. It's like I blanked out or something, and the nurse is giving me this cup of water, and the weird thing is, she's crying. I'm sorry, I say, I didn't mean to hurt you. You didn't, she says. I cry easily, don't you worry about it. I do worry about it, though, because if she's crying, I must have hit her, and I don't remember it which, if you think about it, is really scary. Who knows what I might do and then not remember it. The worst thing happens later, in the cafeteria. Freak has this thing about American chop suey. He loves the stuff. The gooier, the better. You'd never believe a person so small could eat so much. And when he holds up his plate, he always says, Please, sir, more gruel. And I always say, It's American chop suey, not gruel. I looked up gruel, remember? And he always goes, I beg of you, sir, more gruel. And so finally, I go up to get him another helping. When I come back, something is wrong. Freak's face is all red and swollen up, and he's making this huck, huck, huck noise. He can't talk. All he can do is look at me and try to say something with his eyes. And then I'm running to get the nurse. Quick! He can't breathe! He can't breathe! Then she's running as fast as me, and she's yelling for someone to call an ambulance. Back in the cafeteria, Freak is turning purple. The nurse grabs him, and she's got this plastic thing she shoves into his mouth, and his eyes are closed up tight, and one of his legs is kicking. I don't know what to do, so I start hopping up and down in one place. And when the kids keep crowding around, I push them back. And the next thing, Freak's face is starting to look pink instead of purple, and he's breathing okay. Right about then, the ambulance comes. I never even heard the siren and Freak is trying to talk in this croaky voice as they put him on the stretcher. I'm okay, he keeps saying. Really, I'm okay. I just want to go home. The deal is, once they call the ambulance, you have to go to the hospital and get checked out. That's a rule. I keep trying to get into the back of the ambulance with him, but they won't let me. Finally, Mrs. Addison has to come out and pull me away until the ambulance leaves with just the light going and not the siren. You've had quite a day, haven't you? she says, walking me back into the school. It's not me who had quite a day, I say. Kevin is the one. All he did was try and eat his lunch. Mrs. Addison gives me this look, and then she goes, You're going to be okay, Maxwell Kane. I'm sure of it now. She's okay for a principal, but for some reason I still can't make her understand that it's not me who had a really bad Friday the 13th. And I swear on the dictionary, if Freak ever tries to eat American chop suey again, I'll dump it on his head or something.